Good morning and welcome to the EPC weekly update, our weekly look at the key developments in relation to COVID-19 and the implications for Europe's economy, society, its role in the world and for EU politics in general. My name is Jackie Davis, I'm a senior advisor to the European Policy Centre and with me this week are Fabian Zulig, Chief Executive of the European Policy Centre, Yanis Emanoulidis, Director of Studies, and later on, joining us to discuss developments in relation to Brexit, uh, we will be joined by Yannicka Vahoviak, who is a Senior Policy Analyst at the EPC. We're going to start this morning with key developments at EU level, most notably that ruling from the German Constitutional Court on the European Central Bank's quantitative easing programme. We'll discuss what the implications of that are for the bank, for the Eurozone uh, and for the EU in general. And then we will move to an in-depth discussion on where we are with Brexit. Uh, many of you join us every week, so you know the score, but let me remind you of the technicalities here. Your microphones are muted at the moment. Later on, when I come out to the floor, and we'll be doing that twice during this session, if you want to ask a question, then you click on the hand-shaped button on your right, and I will unmute you when I give you the floor. Or you can write your question in the question box. Just click enter a question, write it and hit enter. And could I remind you, please, so I can see what your question is at a glance, I'd be grateful if you could be brief, Twitter length or less if you can manage it. Um, just a warning, we have a lot of you logging in every week for this event, so we may not be able to answer all your questions uh, during uh, this webinar. If we can't, someone will get back to you afterwards uh, in writing to respond. Um, and to get as many of you in, please be as brief as possible. So what we're going to do is we're going to first discuss those key developments except Brexit, and I'll then go out to you for a first round of questions. Then we will turn our attention uh, to Brexit and bring Yannicka in as well. So good morning, gentlemen. Uh, welcome back. Uh, let's start with that ruling by the German Constitutional Court. Um, it's been described as an explosive judgment with the potential spark a constitutional crisis in Germany, the Eurozone as a whole, a challenge to the European Central Bank's independence, a challenge to the primacy of EU law because of its criticism of the European Court of Justice. Yanis, just how serious is this? What are the implications? I think that potentially there are severe implications. Uh, this was um, an unwise uh, ruling at uh, the wrong time. Um, it creates, I think, unnecessary um, uncertainties, both economic, from an economic perspective and from a legal perspective. Um, if you look at the just a couple of takeaways here from the economic perspective, um, it raises questions with regard to the ability of the ECB to do whatever it takes. Um, and we've talked over the past weeks also in our uh, Friday updates about the key significance of the ECB in tackling the current crisis, so the recession, depression, which is ahead of us, uh, creating stability, uh, being there to also help uh, the economic recovery process. Um, so the judgment of the German Constitutional uh, Court is raising some key questions with respect to that role. Um, the judgment does not say that the 2015 bond buying program is illegal. Um, it's not referring to the current, uh, by the way, program. It's referring to something which uh, we had been initiated in 2015. Um, but it raises doubts about its proportionality. It claims that the ECB was not considering the economic consequences of what it was doing, which is absurd. If you know how the ECB works, and also if you followed the ECB's arguments when it initiated the program, it really uh, uh, explained well, what's, why it's doing it, and uh, it will also refer to all the economic potential consequences of it. Um, it uh, undermines uh, in a certain way the independence of the ECB. So it was good that we had a strong reaction from the president of the ECB uh, saying that uh, the ECB continues to be independent, that it is answerable only to the European Parliament, and that it is uh, driven by its mandate, which is price stability. So it was Could good just, that you had a strong reaction. Uh, Can I ask the... why I read that the ECB is unlikely to respond to this quest? Uh, for a proportionality assessment. Is that because it feels very strongly about safeguarding its independence? I mean, if it's if it's absolutely convinced that what it's doing is proportional, that it does take into account, why not simply reply to the Karlsruhe Court and justify it? I think it would be easy for the ECB um, to showcase why its actions have been proportional. However, having said that, what would happen is that one, it would undermine its independence. 
And who's to say that other national constitutional courts would not come with other things in future? Right. Uh, and that would then um, make the ECB hostage uh, to potential uh, rulings of national constitutional courts if it now responds. How would it then have to react or respond um, to future calls from other national uh, constitutional courts? So I think it is wise that the ECB is now uh, reacting, but it's not doing what the uh, German constitutional court has called it to do, um, which is now maybe the role of the Bundesbank, uh, which can um, argue why these actions have been proportionate, which puts uh, the Bundesbank and also its president, Jens Weidmann, in a difficult position, because Jens Weidmann have been one of the more critical voices inside yeah. the ECB with respect to the bond buying program. Um, but beyond the economics, and um, the second main takeaway, um, it's also questionable from a legal perspective. Um, it is challenging in a certain way the EU's legal order. Um, if you all remember, the uh, Bundesverfassungsgericht in 2017 called on the European Court of Justice to examine the legality of the bond buying program. In 2018, this is what the ECJ did. It said that the actions of the ECB were complying with the EU treaties. Uh, and now the uh, Bundesverfassungsgericht um, has cast that somewhat into doubt, um, saying that the principle of uh, proportionality was not comprehensively um, judged by the ECJ, um, saying that the judgment is, uh, was rendered ultra biased, so beyond the powers of the, of, the, of the European Court of Justice, and that challenges the legal supremacy of the ECJ. And it's no coincidence that already in some member states, take for example Poland, you have some people also from the government saying, well, this is showing that uh, when it comes to the rulings of the ECJ, uh, they can also be challenged at national level. So this okay. is undermining the legal uh, supremacy of the European Court of Justice, which is actually really something which uh, is happens for the first time in this way and is actually really challenging. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, Fabian, a brief comment to that, if you will, on how serious you think this is uh, for the ECB itself, for the Eurozone, and, and, and maybe its impact. Could there be an impact in terms of the recovery plan as well? I mean, I think what it is, and I, I fully agree with, with Janis, it's a form of German exceptionalism um, where uh, we actually see something which has been prevalent in certain uh, German legal constitutional circles, uh, which is um, a uh, inability to understand uh, that uh, the European Union has to function on the basis of a common legal framework. Um, and that we cannot have individual countries starting to question that. And I think this is really the long-term implication of this, is the question of and how far does it undermine the common uh, European legal framework. Uh, if we have a situation where on particular issues countries can choose whether they accept that the uh, European Court of Justice uh, rules supreme, um, then uh, we can have a complete undermining of the common achievements. Um, so I think this is something which has to be dealt with robustly. Uh, and there's a lot of responsibility on the German system um, to make sure that this is dealt with within the German constitutional exactly. system. I mean, it's a problem they have to sort out. It's not something, yes. uh, yeah. Absolutely. Um, and I think we cannot have a situation where uh, the uh, ECB has to go and justify itself um, um, because um, and I think from a German pers perspective, I would love to see uh, what the reaction would have been if this has ha had happened to the Bundesbank, uh, that the Bundesbank is called to justify itself in front of the court. Uh, there would have been an outcry uh, about the independence of the central bank. And the ECB was set up precisely on the model of the Bundesbank. Uh, the yeah. idea was exactly that it wouldn't have to justify itself politically. So I, I think this goes against uh, some of the principles which we have to defend. And that is really the, the implication. I think in the short term, it is not going to make much difference. Um, I think the markets have not um, taken the, the ruling in a way uh, which is worrying. The markets have not um, put yeah. into question the ability of the ECB to act, um, at least so far. Um, so I think this is something which has potentially longer term repercussions, but in the short term, I don't see many changes. It is striking yeah, to me, having been here for 20 odd years, or that the Karlsruhe court has been in the headlines very often, and usually 
uh, contrary to expectations, it doesn't do anything dramatic. This is the first time I can remember where it's done something with the potential to be very dramatic. Briefly, yeah, if you is, want, Janice, because I want to move on yeah, to other just, issues. Just two small things. One is that uh, I think that what this shows is that the Bundesverfassungsgericht also wants to play a role in the future. So this ruling also has to do with its own ability in the future to have a say. It wanted to secure that uh, Karlsruhe will be asked also in future. Um, and second point is, Fabian is right, the immediate consequences are not as strong, uh, but as we've discussed also in previous uh, Friday updates, we're just in the beginning of the COVID-19 crisis, and we're just seeing the economic consequences and maybe also the financial consequences of this crisis unfolding. So as time continues, I think, my personal assumption is that the role of the ECB in fighting the economic financial consequences of this crisis will be enormous. Uh, and this is where this ruling can cast into doubt certain things which have to be done also politically in future. And we see all those who have been critical yeah. of the ECB now cheering in Germany and yeah. saying, look, we've always told you that the ECB is overdoing it and these voices are now being strengthened through this party. Thank you. Um I mentioned the EU recovery plan. Turning to that, uh, we were expecting uh, on Wednesday the European Commission to unveil its proposals, its new proposals for the EU budget uh, post 2020, the international financial framework. Uh, Ursula von der Leyen had said at the last EU leaders teleconference she would do it uh, for May 6th, prompting that famous remark from Angela Merkel, don't forget to tell us first. Um, she didn't. It's not as far as we can tell on the agenda for the Commission next week either. What is happening? Why the delay? Uh, how long is it likely to be? Do we know? And do we know anything about how this is shaping up? Perhaps Janice first on this one as well, please. Well, I think that there are two main reasons why we're seeing this delay. Um, one is that um, actually the European Commission was told to do some homework. Um, von der Leyen was told by also heads of state and government, including the German Chancellor, that there needs to be more clarity of um, what do we need money for, um, who needs support, uh, which sectors are particularly in need, and what kind of amounts do we actually or do we predict that we would need in order to counter the negative economic effects of the COVID-19 crisis. So you need to come up with this first step before you make the second, which is actually come with a proposal. So that homework needs to be done. Um, and secondly, I think the main problem is that once you come up with a proposal, you need to make sure that that proposal is not being agreed by everyone, but that there is no negative, harsh reactions to it. So that you take, get on board key players, member states, governments, key member states, governments, to make sure that you have a proposal which actually can then get into the next phase, which is to actually get it through, to get the so agreement at the level of heads of state the government yeah. and the council. Sorry? So in a sense, uh, Fabian, this, this delay is simply wise. Uh, there have been moments when Ursula von der Leyen has been accused uh, in the crisis so far of jumping the gun uh, and moving too fast, taking time to do the analysis and to make sure, as Yanis says, you've basically got member states on board, not on the detail, but on the broad thrust. Uh, does that show the Commission is learning from some of its mistakes of the early phases of the crisis? Or would you be more concerned that this delay indicates it's going to be very hard to get an agreement? Um, in, in some ways, it's both. Uh, I don't think it's unexpected that we have this delay. Um, I I've, um, didn't think it was very uh, feasible to get uh, a new proposal done that quickly, um, not only because it requires quite a lot of technical work um, and there are some big questions which uh, have to be answered. For example, what are the expectations in terms of future inflation, in terms of future GDP? How do you actually deal with um, the uh, leverage instruments? I mean, these are uh, big technical questions uh, which have to be answered. But uh, more importantly, as Janis is saying, uh, you need to get to a landing zone which the member states will accept um, and that landing zone uh, of course you can't work out all the detail but at least the proposal has to be accepted as the basis of negotiation and we have seen in the past that if certain member states are not happy uh, with the uh, strategic direction of the proposals that they actually get set aside completely and that would be the worst possible outcome in the current situation uh, because then uh, getting any kind of agreement uh, is very very unlikely. 
in any case, I think in terms of timing, um, we need to have these discussions, at least the final discussions on uh, the MFF during the German presidency. Uh, it is unlikely uh, that we get the final agreement before then. Of course, the preparation has to be before then. Uh, but I would expect that we probably need a face-to-face -face summit uh, at the end of this where um, you get uh, into the 48 hours or 72 hours or whatever it might be, um, which in the end you then uh, present the compromise. Okay. Um, but I think we shouldn't forget that also there are still very fundamental differences between the member states. Um, so I wouldn't assume that there is agreement yet. Um, I think this is still a process and uh, it will take a, a big willingness to compromise from all sides so that we get somewhere which is acceptable. Okay. And okay. for yeah, the moment, the that is not there yet. Yeah, yeah it's pretty there's, there's, there's a link, by the way, to the discussion we were just having with respect to the ruling of the Bundesverfassungsgericht, because the ruling and how it raises some questions with respect to the role of the ECB increases the pressure on the member states to deliver. It increases the pressure on them to play their parts in a package which allows to do whatever it takes um, uh, to defend and to react uh, to the negative consequences of the, of the COVID-19 crisis. It's, so actually it is really, it's increasing yeah. the uh, it's increasing the pressure. Um, but uh, as Fabian said, there are huge differences still between member states, and it will take time. Um, but uh, it's good to have increased pressure because otherwise, we've seen also in the past the member states think, "Well, we've done enough. We can now live with the situation as it is," and that's not the case. Focuses minds. One more issue I want to turn to, and then we'll take questions on everything but Brexit, and then we'll come to the Brexit issue. Um, it's on the question of what has become to be known, uh, as, as is typical with the EU, taking a French word and making it sound English, deconfinement. Uh, not a word in English, as far as I'm aware. Uh, de the Commission produced some guidelines, and it's been desperately trying to get member states to coordinate what they do uh, as different countries move towards lifting the lockdown to different degrees. Has there been any success? It doesn't appear that any member state, certainly when they announce their plans, makes any reference to what anybody else is doing, except in relation to borders between countries, where we've seen, for example, the Baltic countries uh, announcing that they will lift borders between themselves, create a mini Schengen, if you like. Um, apart from that, there seems to be very little coordination. Is that right? And if it is, how much of a problem is that? Yes, there is. Um no real coordination at least and there's no agreement among the EU27 to coordinate. Uh, we have a lot of discussions at national level. We're looking at each other to see what others are doing in terms of uh, steps to uh, in the process of deconfinement. Um, we've had a commission a document uh, laying out some principles uh, which more or less are being adhered to but these principles were principles they were not concrete enough. Um, we now know that the commission is working on more sector specific uh, roadmap, so there will be something, for example, with respect to uh, tourism, which is uh, supposed to come out. Um, but even then, even if we have that roadmap, the question is whether member states will adhere to it. Uh, we see more and more bilateral initiatives or multilateral initiatives where member states are getting together and discussing it among themselves um, mm -hmm. as to what they would be doing in certain areas where things are linked. Um, but we've had a chaotic entry into a uh, confinement and it seems that we're having a chaotic exit um, meaning that we are not coordinating among each other when it comes to deconfinement everybody is doing what they think is more suitable from their perspective and i think that is a bad thing to do um, yeah. if you look into the into the, the the commission's numbers we've seen this week with respect to what they expect for 2020 2021 in terms of the economic development we see that certain members are strongly hit more than others and it's no coincidence that countries like italy spain greece uh, croatia are more hit than others and it has to do also with the tourism sector so if you yeah. don't coordinate so you're undermining your 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 everything you're doing in order to counter the economic effects of the COVID-19 crisis, and by not coordinating with okay. respect to deconfinement, you, you, you're worsening the situation. Yeah. And, and Fabian, um, do you think there is a risk of, a, of, of that this turns into a, a competitiveness race, as it were, in that you race to reopen first because there's some economic advantage to be gained from that, even if it's not wise uh, from a health perspective? Are you concerned uh, that, that 
that is a factor in what countries are deciding to do? Or do you think they really are very much focusing on that na the national situation and that balance, uh, looking at the reproduction rate of, of the virus and then saying, okay, now we can go? To what extent is the economics of this driving it, do you think? Um, I, of course, I'm, I'm um, not a health professional, so I can't assess uh, in terms of, of the um, health impact whether it's the right thing to do. But I think it is worth noting that in a number of countries, uh, there seems to be um, a, a tendency to go against uh, the rules which were set up beforehand. Uh, by these countries themselves about when they would come out of uh, the, um, the the lockdown. Um, so for me, there seems to be uh, quite a haste, um, a, a competitive race. I think in part that has to do with the economics. Um, I think, yes, uh, countries are looking at what might be the impact if they are behind what is happening in other countries. But even more so, I think it's the politics and the psychology of this. Um, I think what we are seeing now um, was almost inevitable. Um, once you start loosening some restrictions, it becomes very difficult to convince the rest of the population that you have to continue with other restrictions. On what basis are you then going to make that judgment? Uh, and people will start to question it. Um, I think we've seen in countries like Germany that it's not uh, only an issue between countries, it's a, an issue within countries. Uh, the federal states in Germany, which have the competence um, to act on these, are racing against each other at the moment and trying to, to get to a point. And you hear a lot uh, about uh, this kind of idea that, well, if you are in Bavaria, um, are you allowed to go on holiday somewhere else in Germany? if another federal state says you're not allowed. And those are the kind of, of conflicts which uh, I think are very hard to resolve. Um, and I think at the moment, uh, what it requires is credible leadership, um, which can explain to people what is the right thing to do from a health perspective. And that has to continue to come first. We have to be able to get this health problem under control because if the pandemic is not under control, the economic situation will get much, much worse. And the one thing we haven't talked about, but we should mention, is perhaps a, a bit of a win this week for Ursula von der Leyen uh, with the vaccine pledging conference, uh, which went well, which was a moment of EU leadership, uh, albeit co-hosted by a number of countries. But nevertheless, perhaps uh, we've talked a lot in the past about um, the public relations side of this and the perception of is the EU part of the solution, is it doing something meaningful? We should perhaps give a hat tip uh, to the Commission President for the success of that event. I'm going to go out to the room and I'm going to ask, I see a written question, but it relates to uh, the UK and its trade talks with America. So I'm going to park that one until we come uh, to Brexit. Um, but I see John Palmer, is your question non-Brexit? John, are Good you there? Yes, I am, sorry. Uh, Good morning. Good, thank you. Uh, I agree with absolutely everything that uh, Yanis and Fabian have said about the judgment of the con uh, German Constitutional Court and the worrying political implications that it might reinforce negative uh, trends in EU decision making. I want to ask, however, whether or to what extent you share the view that you hear fairly widespread among uh, economists, people in the financial sector, that uh, this development, uh, following on what's happened in recent years, may encourage what, uh, it's a shocking way of putting it, but the de facto conversion of monetary policy into a surrogate fiscal policy. Not legally, not in so many words, but that the net economic effect in terms of the tone, uh, the terms of financial and the volume of financial transfers, that that is what it amounts to. Is there anything in this and how does one, should one react to it uh, de facto? Okay. I don't know who, which one of you would like to pick that up. Fabian? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think um, this is a very difficult question to answer at the moment because frankly, um, I don't know whether the kind of um, theories, the kind of ways we were looking at economic policy before the crisis um, are going to be valid uh, for the coming years. 
um, we have a complete change uh, in the way we think uh, about certain um, economic levers. Uh, monetary policy uh, was already um, under pressure before this crisis hit. Uh, we were in a situation where the traditional monetary policy, uh, low interest rates, um, trying to, to steer the economy um, while keeping inflation under control, uh, simply wasn't producing the results uh, which uh, monetary policy has produced in the past. Um, we are going to have to rethink um, economic policy, uh, I think, very fundamentally. Um, monetary policy, fiscal policy, uh, the role uh, which the state plays in terms of guarantees, the involvement of the state uh, within uh, the economy. Uh, we are going to go back to a world uh, where um, a number of countries will have, um, for lack of a better word, national champions again. Um, and we will see, uh, in, for example, what these national champions uh, will do in terms of soft budget constraints. Are they going to be able to borrow um, at favorable conditions? Um, so we are talking about, I think, in economic terms, a very different world. And I think the one thing we can say is that there's enormous uncertainty. Um, but that uh, policy will have to adapt um, and also because many of the things we've done in the past simply are not going to work. So uh, I think one of the key questions and uh, going back to the Bundesverfassungsgericht um, uh, ruling, uh, one of the key questions for example is do we actually have to rethink um, how we approach uh, inflation? Because in a reality where every um, member state is going to have very high debt levels, in many cases unsustainable debt levels, um, in an, a world with low growth or an absence uh, of growth completely, uh, we will have to rethink some of the fundamental ways we're looking at economic policy. Thank you yes. very much. Janice, unless you do have some, a quick one, and then I'd like to turn to Brexit. Just to add to what Fabian was saying, um, this is a very uh, unusual situation and it requires and it will require a lot of unusual instrument being used by central banks all over the world. And if you have a look at what's being done, for example, in the US, uh, we see that the reaction is going from the central bank. It's going in a way which is very unusual and the ECB will have to do the same. Uh, and once we uh, are in, an, in other phases of this crisis and we'll see what the impact of the crisis has been, for example, on national budgets, on national debt levels, the ECB will have to play a key role. Um, and we will not be able to do without it. Um, so uh, in a certain way, the role of the ECB, I think, in the current crisis will be enhanced. It will, be get, it will get more important than it was before. And when we, in retrospect, we'll look at what had happened, uh, I think we will again say thank you to the ECB. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll come back to all those issues uh, in the weeks to come, I am absolutely sure. Uh, but let us turn now to Brexit, and I'd like to welcome uh, Yannicka Vahoviak, who, as I mentioned earlier, is a junior policy analyst at the EPC working on Brexit issues. Yannicka, are you there? Hello. Uh, yes, and hello. a very warm well welcome to the weekly update. Um, so, uh, we are just ahead. Next week we have another round of negotiations, then a further one starting on June the 1st. And then in mid-June, we are supposed to have the high-level meeting between the two sides at EU leader level uh, to discuss and assess progress. That is also the moment the UK government has said uh, will be when it decides whether enough progress is being made to continue or it starts to prepare for a no deal. And of course, technically that legal uh, necessity uh, to decide on whether we want an extension or not by the end of June, question how fixed is that? But that's for later. As it stands, the mood music, I think it's fair to say probably couldn't be worse. Uh, the Trade Commissioner Phil Hogan said in an interview a couple of days ago, he's a blunt speaking man, and he said, and I quote, there is no sign that our British friends are approaching negotiations with a plan to succeed. And he added, I hope I'm wrong, but I don't think so. He also suggested that the British government would be, was planning now, if you like, to crash the talks, that it doesn't want a deal and it will use the cover of the COVID-19 crisis uh, to justify or explain away any chaos that would ensue from a no deal. So just to point out, the EPC has 
already written a couple of commentaries on this since the crisis began, one by Fabian in the early days of the crisis and another last week by Leonard Schutter on the next phase of Brexit negotiations, where he was underlining the importance of the European Union maintaining its inclusive approach uh, among the member states uh, in order to build that consensus and maintain a united front. Uh, there's more in the pipeline. Yannicka will be producing one uh, on the extension question. And before the summer, a bigger multi-author paper is planned on the long-term uh, UK-EU relationship. So, uh, Yannicka, if I could come to you first, and this question of the timeline. Uh, I mentioned those key dates that are coming up. Um, is either side, if I can put it this way, likely to blink? Uh, do you think we will be looking uh, to an extension, despite uh, what the UK says so far? It's adamant there won't be. Uh, what is your assessment of, of where we are and whether, if the UK don't ask for one, might the EU do so instead? Uh, thank you, Jackie. Um, yeah, so I think um, currently there's no sign um, that the UK will ask for an extension before the deadline on the 1st of July. So under the provisions of the withdrawal agreement, um, there seems to be um, the assumption in the team surrounding Boris Johnson that um, the EU is considerably weakened by the COVID-19 crisis and um, that going forward the EU will be even more weak and will be divided and that if the UK just waits long enough um, that the EU might be willing to make concessions later this year and that the um, UK will therefore be able um, to achieve a more favorable deal. Um, I think that's a miscalculation on part of the UK because um, I think they are underestimating um, the EU's unity when it comes to Brexit and also um, the EU's willingness to do everything to protect the integrity of the single market and the EU will not be willing um, to make a deal at any cost. Um, and um, I think on the UK side, um, the thinking is that um, um, the thinking is that the, the transition period is very unfavorable to the UK and um, that the whole point of Brexit is really to gain legal and political autonomy. And so there's no point in uh, prolonging this state of the transition period where they don't have this autonomy. Um, mm. So, and obviously then there's also um, the idea, I think in some parts um, of the Tory party that um, at the end of the year, there might already be a lot of disruption and um, the econo economic downturn um, from COVID-19 is already there and that the cost of Brexit might um, be drowned out and not be as noticeable. But I think that's a form of brinkmanship that's very um, dangerous and um, might lead to or increases the likelihood of a no-deal scenario um, at the end of the year. And, and Fabian, um, uh, Yannick was saying there, pointing out that, that this suggestion that the UK actually wants to exploit this crisis, exploit the difficulties that m all member states are facing uh, in dealing with the crisis, uh, a very cynical ploy if it's true. Um, and how do you think i mean is that do you think the perception among other member states and what is that we've already seen a fairly angry tone after the last set of negotiations and i mentioned that quote from commissioner hogan i mean what impact would that have uh, in terms of how the eu responds uh, to this this cynical move if it is that um, I, I think firstly just to to reinforce um what, what yannicka was saying and to be uh, very blunt about this. Um, it is reckless not to ask for an extension. Uh, whatever you think uh, about the long-term EU-UK relationship, uh, this is a historic decision. Um, and if the UK doesn't see sense, then history will not judge the UK kindly. Uh, this is something where there shouldn't even be a discussion. Uh, we shouldn't actually be sitting here having to focus on Brexit in the current situation because COVID-19 is far more important. And the reality is that uh, unlike what is being claimed by some people in the UK, uh, the COVID-19 crisis uh, is being reinforced by Brexit. It is, it is not that the effect of Brexit is going to be uh, lessened in some ways because we have this crisis. Uh, 
in reality, uh, if you're adding another economic shock to an already existing shock, you are aggravating things. You are accumulating negative impact rather than reducing it. So it is a, a very cynical plot to think in terms of you can hide this effect um, because in effect it is about simply hiding it politically. Um, and I think the reaction to that on the EU side uh, is going to be very negative. Um, but we are already in a situation where uh, from an EU perspective there isn't very much uh, happening in terms of the negotiations. We are not making progress on the really contentious areas. Uh, on the contentious areas, uh, the UK is even refusing to negotiate. So we're not even talking about a, negotiating, a negotiation taking place. Uh, so at the moment, uh, we are going nowhere. And this is, um, I think, in the end, and it needs to be emphasized over and over again, what the UK government is doing at the moment. It is choosing uh, whether um, deliberately or not, but it is choosing to increase the probability of no deal very significant. Just to, just to clarify on that deliberately or not, do you, are you in the camp, do, is your gut feeling that it's what, what Yannicka was pointing to when she said uh, the UK feels that transition period is disadvantageous, so deliberately trying to find a way to crash out and if you like from January set the clock to zero and start all over again, or this weakening that she spoke about in terms of we can get more out of the year if we just wait because they're going to be in a bigger mess by the end of the year. For you, and what's the balance between a deliberate strategy to crash out uh, or a deliberate strategy to try and exploit the situation? Um, I, I think this uh, is very difficult to assess from the outside um, because also there are different voices in government. Um, and uh, I wouldn't expect that all of the ministers, for example, have the same view. You have already seen some kind of nuancing um, from certain people in the public debate. Um, but the reality is, uh, even if it is not a deliberate ploy, what will the UK do when we hit the wall? What will happen um, when we get to autumn? Um, the, the deal uh, as the UK wants it is not going to be available. The EU is never going to offer uh, what the dreams are uh, behind the, the, the uh, deal at the moment. Um, so um, the question is what do you do then? And uh, the uh, expectation of some is that we will get the U-turn um, from Johnson at that point, uh, that there will be an acceptance that um, uh, that will have to happen then. I'm very skeptical about that. I think the politics are different in the UK. So I think what we're heading to, um, whether deliberate or not, is no deal. Okay. Uh, Yannick, if I could come back to you and on this question of progress, because Fabian's saying that we're going nowhere. Uh, based on what we know happened in the last round of talks and as they prepare for the next round next week, are there any areas where we can identify any progress at all? And what are the most important sticking points, do you think? Um, yeah, I think it's it's fair to say um, that the negotiations um, have reached an impasse and that there has been very little progress so far. Um, I think apart from the um, obvious um, disagreements or obvious areas of disagreements like the level playing field provisions and also the agreement on fisheries, um, the problem is that there is um, quite a fundamental difference in the way both sides are approaching the negotiations in general. I think the EU um, is basing its um, negotiation, uh, are basing their negotiations on uh, the political declaration, on, on the jointly agreed text. Um, and um, the UK um, seems to um, refer to um, other examples of free trade agreements that the EU has with other countries and tries to um, use those as templates. Um, but that, of course, ignores the fact that the um, EU-UK relationship is very special and that um, in terms of proximity, in terms of the size of the um, UK economy and that um, the EU doesn't just want a simple free trade agreement but an overarching economic partnership um, that is way more comprehensive. Um, so I think you have this fundamental um, difference in approach and then also that the um, EU wants one deal that um, that is comprehensive and that has an overarching governance framework uh, 
while the UK seems to pursue this very um, selective approach of looking at different sectors and having um, selective demands. And in this context, and then Yanis, I'll cut bring you into the discussion, but in this context, how do you read the argument uh, that has been raging for the last week over the question of a, an EU office in Belfast, in Northern mm -hmm. Ireland, uh, as part of the controls on making sure that what was put in place in the Irish protocol uh, actually is being implemented? I mean, a suggestion not only that the UK has departed from the political declaration, but it's also departing from the terms of the withdrawal agreement. What, without going into the detail of why this office matters or doesn't matter, what does it tell us about that, that as you say, difference of approach between the two sides? Um, yeah, I think the um, the row about um, uh, EU presence in Northern Ireland um, in a way represents or is a proxy war um, that represents the conflict that is inherent in Brexit. Um, that is that the UK wants as little, as little intrusion as possible and wants maximum, maximum autonomy, um, while the EU on the other side um, wants um, appropriate reassurances, um, wants legal guarantees um, wherever possible. So um, you can see a clash of these um, fundamental approaches here as well. And I think what it also shows is that there's by now a very low level of trust um, between the two sides yeah. and um, that the EU side um, has identified the Irish protocol as um, the biggest challenge in implementing the withdrawal agreement and um, that it's not just the rhetoric on the British side, but also the lack of action in implementing this protocol um, that um, has okay. led to an, a decrease in trust. Thank you. Fabian, you wanted to come in and then I'll go to Yanis. Yeah, just very briefly, I, I think this um, almost looks like a Trumpian plot. Um, focus on the discussion around uh, something like the office there, uh, to try to um, distract from uh, the reality that uh, we have a major issue with the implementation of the Northern Ireland Protocol, which is that at the moment uh, the UK is not implementing uh, what it committed to uh, under the withdrawal agreement. Um, and uh, I think this is what we should be focusing on in terms of the debate, um, because there is no chance that we are going to have any form of deal unless the UK starts to implement uh, what is in the withdrawal agreement. There is no way uh, that the member states or the institutions can accept that an agreement which has been reached between the two sides is not being implemented. And um, for the moment at least, um, while the UK side is saying it is implementing it, uh, the reality is nothing is happening on the ground. And time is getting very short uh, to be able to uh, make progress on that. Uh, and for me, this is one of the core issues uh, which has to be addressed. Um, and this discussion around the, the Belfast office uh, is a way of trying to deflect attention from that part, uh, which is far more important. OK, thank you. Yanis, I'm coming to you and then I'm going to go out to the room. I'm seeing some questions coming in, so we will tackle those very shortly. But just coming back on, on this, this trust question, uh, and Yannicka was talking there about the EU wanting assurances. And the more the rhetoric on the UK side sounds completely intransigent and so on, the more assurances the EU is looking for. I mean, let me play devil's advocate. I hear from Fabian and from Yannicka a sense, no, the UK uh, is really, they are talking tough and they probably mean tough and they may well not back down. But could we see it simply as sort of the inevitable sabre rattling at this stage? We're at a crunch moment with that mid-June high level meeting uh, due to happen. How important is the anger on both sides? I was very struck by Michel Barnier's tone after the last round of negotiations. He's normally a man who is fairly measured and calm. And while his, he chose his words carefully, the tone of his voice and the frustration uh, was absolutely evident when he said our British uh, partners um, are, do not wish to commit seriously on a number of fundamental points. How serious do you think is that tone? And if we do continue the talks after June, if the UK doesn't walk away and we get to November, December, and as Yannicka indicated, the UK is seeking to exploit the weaknesses created by COVID, how do you think the EU will react, if you like, emotionally as well as uh, politically? 
I think we <clears throat> have already seen not only now but over a while that there are severe issues of trust or distrust. Um, and uh, the logic, um, what Janneke was referring to in the beginning, of saying that the EU will be weaker at towards the end of the year and that will be something which we can exploit. Um, one, it is wrong, uh, but at second, it's creating these negative sentiments on the side of the EU27 and it further undermines trust. Um, so understanding that uh, London believes that uh, yes, economically the EU was hit by COVID-19, situation will worsen and that then the EU27 will be ready to find a compromise which will be closer to what London wants, um, I think is a misreading. Um, I think, yes, the, we will be as EU27 in a very difficult situation in a couple of months' time, uh, given the negative effects of this crisis, but I don't think that that will make the EU27 ready to go for something which doesn't make sense, because not going for an extension is the wrong thing to do. It's now responsible to ask for, to go for an extension, to have an extension, to discuss the future relationship um, and you will not get and you don't think that the EU27 will give up that position. Um, so the logic uh, which now some in London seem to be following is a logic as a logic which one will not work and it is undermining further the trust of the EU27. And what we've seen in the past is that it, re that it unites the 27 in saying no to certain things. Indeed, it reminds me of a time when David Cameron, when he was trying to negotiate what he called a better deal before the referendum, raised a, at a Euro crisis summit where really member states of the Eurozone felt they were fighting to save their currency. And at one o'clock in the morning, he said, oh, about my very particular point on the city of London, caused huge anger, a misreading of the mood uh, and of the appropriateness of raising it at that time. Fabian, I have lots of questions coming in. So you want to come in, but very short if you would. Yeah, very short. Um, I think what uh, is particularly striking about this intervention by Barnier is that in this kind of negotiation, the Commission should be the UK's best friend. Uh, <laughs> it is only the Commission which can actually bring together the 27, uh, which can enforce some form of compromise across them. Uh, and if the Commission doesn't feel that uh, the UK is trying to reach a common landing zone, uh, that is very bleak indeed. Um, I think what we should be doing at the moment is we should be having discussions, uh, not around fundamentally whether we are going to talk about things like fisheries, whether we're going to talk around uh, things like level playing field. Uh, we should be looking at what does that actually mean in detail? What could a deal look like? Where is the common ground which can be found in these areas? And for that, you need the Commission. So if the Commission feels that we're not making progress, and it almost becomes a political statement from the Commission, um, then we really are going nowhere. And that's, I think, the, the big difference between technical negotiation and the political negotiation. On technical issues, on some areas, yes, of course, there are negotiations going on. Yes, of course, we are making progress. But at the political level, where the big compromises need to happen, we're making no progress okay. at all. Two questions, uh, both relating, and I'm gonna ask you each time for very brief responses, because we don't have long. Who relating to the US-UK trade talks? Do they have any chance of progressing before the November presidential uh, elections? And I think this links uh, very much to something the UK has been saying about, right, we will do these talks in parallel because again, it puts pressure on the UK, uh, oh, sorry, on the EU side, if we're doing fantastically uh, in our negotiations with the Americans and gonna get something marvelous the EU doesn't have. Um, who would like to come in in terms of, uh, are they going to make any progress and does that matter? What influence does that or no influence at all on the UK EU? I see you smiling Fabian so I have to come to you. Why the right smile? Well I think it's two uh, questions which have to be answered. One, how likely is it that they make progress and the second is uh, what would that actually look like and is it in the UK's best interest to make progress? Um, I think the likelihood is rather low um, because when we're looking at real trade deals, and I don't mean some form of declaration where you say we're going to work together or some uh, minor opening in a particular sector, I'm talking about a real trade negotiation, we know that they take time, we know that they are politically difficult, we know that there have to be internal compromises, we know that, for example, there are political divisions in the UK, uh, sorry, in the US, which would make it very difficult to have an agreement with the UK, just to mention one area, but it's not the only one. Uh, 
uh, is the question of Northern Ireland. If uh, the UK doesn't implement what was agreed on Northern Ireland, uh, the Irish caucus in uh, the Houses of Congress is not going to be very happy. Um, so it is very unlikely that they will be progressing a trade deal. But the second issue is, even if it was possible to get a trade deal, yes. this is a trade deal with a highly transactional president who would be looking at what is the maximum we can get out for the US, particularly yeah. in the context of the COVID crisis, where you want to present your electorate, and we shouldn't forget there's a presidential election coming up, you want to give your electorate some wins. So one of the biggest wins um, for the US president would be to be able to announce that the UK is completely open for uh, US agricultural products. Um, so what that would do, for example, to US agric uh, to UK agriculture, what it would do to UK industry, um, I think uh, is uh, unquestionably uh, it would not be a good deal for the UK. And there's also the question of whether uh, the UK has the bandwidth uh, to be doing both these negotiations at the same time when indeed they didn't have any trade negotiations uh, negotiators until quite recently, given this was an EU competence. Uh, but um, can I come to you, Janneke, on uh, a question from Philippe de Book? Is there a compromise possible due to the special circumstances that without asking for a prolongation of the transition, de facto you get to the end of 2020 and some con discussions continue into 2021. He's really saying, do you think there's a way that Boris Johnson can save face? That effectively, we do continue, there is a form of extension, only it's not called that, and therefore politically he finds it easier to sell it. Well, I think it's important to emphasize that um, the only legally guaranteed way of agreeing an extension is um, adhering to the 1st of July deadline. Um, of course, there is um, a possibility that Boris Johnson will realize later this year that he is not able to conclude a deal and that he actually needs and wants more time. And um, I think there are options available then, um, but it would be legally and politically extremely difficult and tricky. Um, so probably um, there would have to be an international treaty um, that is in all likelihood going to be a mixed treaty and that would mean that you would need the unanimous um, uh, support from the council, you would need uh, an agreement from the European Parliament and depending on the laws in the member states you would also need um, a ratification by national parliaments and in some cases even regional parliaments and we've seen in the case of the CETA um, um, trade deal, how um, difficult um, that can be when um, you have so many veto players that come into play at this stage. And there's a linked question, really. Uh, Fabian, perhaps if I could ask you this one. Do you think the idea of a no deal um, followed by negotiations, you talked about some, some negotiations on specific sectors in relation to, to other trade talks, but do you think the idea of a no deal followed by negotiations on sectors, for example, cooperation in criminal justice has some merits. Would And, and if it does, if that might be an approach, um, would this favour more the UK or the EU? You said earlier uh, the UK has been trying to cherry pick the things it will talk about and the things it won't talk about, whereas the EU wants one deal on the whole lot. If we go no deal, could we see that process afterwards turning into a series of sectoral discussions, do you think? Um, I, I think with all of this, um, we are firmly back in unicorn territory. Um, there is um, magical thinking on the UK side um, about what might happen or what might not happen. Um, I think, for example, just to, to go back to the last point on, in terms of reaching a deal, um, there is no way uh, that the European Union is even going to consider any deal, any extension, anything um, beyond uh, the, the negotiations if there's no agreement on fisheries. Um, so we, we are not actually over any of the hurdles and uh, by delaying um, the uh, negotiations uh, we can actually have a real discussion on some of these issues. Um, but if we don't get um, a, an extension um, and then we end up with no deal, which then I think is the most likely outcome, 
Um, yes, there is this idea uh, of then negotiating mini deals, trying to, uh, through unilateral or bilateral actions, uh, to mitigate some of the impact. Uh, this is back in the territory where we have already been. It's the managed no deal scenario, uh, which is a catastrophe. Um, yeah. Yes, you can try to, to do some things, but in the end, uh, one of the big issues here uh, is about the uncertainty you're creating. If you're okay. doing yeah. this, everything is uncertain um, and business will find this an even more difficult situation to manage. Thank you. We are almost out of time and I want to come to each of you just for a very final brief comment. But if it's a quick one, Bard Vandvik, can you hear me? Well, hang on, let me try again. You've self-muted. I can't unmute you. No, I can't. Sorry, I'm going to have to leave that because we are almost out of time. Uh, OK, um, just coming to where we go from here, I mentioned that the EPC will be publishing this multi-author paper uh, before the summer on the long-term relationship. I think I know the answer to this, given uh, how you've replied to my earlier questions about where we are now and what it all means. I detect an air of doom, gloom and horrible pessimism. Yanis, is there any scope to be at all optimistic that somehow we can get to a place where in the long term the UK EU relationship is put on a positive footing uh, which at the very least limits the damage of the kind we've been discussing what is your prognosis for the long term based on where we are now it's literally one minute each same question um, unfortunately I'm rather pessimistic uh, in the foreseeable future I do not see that we will get to a political situation which will be suitable to work out a long-term relationship which will be logical to actually work out. Um, taking up something which uh, Philip de Gouk said earlier when he was talking about the, to help Johnson save face. Um, one, I don't think that um, the EU27 will be ready to do that as we were discussing earlier. And as the situation, the COVID-19 crisis uh, gets worse in terms of economic and financial effects, uh, I don't see that that will be um, improved over the upcoming uh, months. Uh, and, the, and the last point is, if you want to help someone to save face, the person who you're trying to help to save face, face needs to be willing, needs to want to be uh, helped. Um, and I don't see that actually that being the case on the side of Boris Johnson. I still see that this is more of an ideological battle which has taken place. It's motivated by ideology rather than by, um, by, by logic, um, by economic logic, um, and also by other logic with respect to what should be done in terms of the long-term relationship between okay. the UK. So I'm rather pessimistic, sorry. Yannicka, same question. Um, <laughs> yeah, I agree with Yannis, and I think it's um, going to be extremely difficult to reach a deal um, until the end of this year. Um, an extension to the transition period um, is required. And I think maybe uh, the one positive note would be that um, a U-turn is still possible and uh, that in the past, the past three extensions have also been requested at the very last minute. So, um, and Johnson is someone who has changed his mind in the past. So um, there is still some hope, but I'm not too optimistic. And, and this is Brad, after all, who talked about dying in a ditch. He'd rather die in a ditch than ask for an extension, and then he promptly did, uh, and has no shame in doing so. So let's hope uh, you might be right. Fabian, you have the last word. Uh, you sound very pessimistic and indeed angry uh, at what the UK uh, is doing at the moment. Um, is there any glimmer of light in all of this? Um. I'm afraid that uh, apart from the very small chance of a U-turn, which I think is more unlikely than it was in the past because of domestic politics, uh, but I am very pessimistic. Um, I uh, have been consistently thinking from the start of this process that a no deal at the end um, is a high likelihood. Um, and by now, I would say that likelihood has increased. So um, I've gone from uh, around 70% likelihood of no deal at the end uh, to somewhere around 90% now. So I am very pessimistic. There's still a chance. But if you can't even compromise on this question of the extension, which yeah. I think in the end is not about 
what you think about Brexit. It is not about reversing Brexit. It is simply about a delay, a break, so that we can deal with this crisis. If you cannot even compromise on that, in light of a global crisis, which is having fundamental impacts everywhere around the world, and in light of the worst recession in 300 years in the UK, if you can't compromise on that, it's very hard to see how you would compromise on a deal at the end of this year. And on that rather depressing note, uh, particularly mm. speaking as a Brit, but also a Belgian now, uh, on that depressing note, uh, thank you very much. Thank you uh, particularly to Yannicka. It's great to have you joining the weekly update. Hope we'll see you again. Uh, and Yanis and Fabian. And I should say that next week, I mentioned uh, the start of this next round of negotiations. While they're in the midst of talking, there will be another uh, EPC event focusing on this. Uh, the state of Brexit, deal or no deal, Wednesday, May the 13th, uh, from 11 until 12, where the guest will be Tony Connolly, who is, of course, the Europe editor of RTE, the Irish broadcaster. He's written several books on this issue, and he will be discussing with Fabian and Yannicka uh, where we are and where we're going. Uh, so that's on Wednesday. On Tuesday, Jobs and Social Rights Commissioner Nicholas Schmidt uh, will be uh, taking part in a 60-minute briefing to talk about the EU social agenda in times of COVID-19. And on Thursday, another commissioner, uh, Elisa Ferreira, the Commissioner for Cohesion and Reforms, will be talking about how to ensure a cohesive recovery. Uh, so lots coming up and publication-wise, if you haven't already read them, uh, do take a look at Andrew Duff's commentary on the 70th anniversary of the Schuman Declaration and the Conference on the Future of Europe. Johan Bierkham's commentary on Europe's hidden weapon in combating COVID-19, the single market. And another by Ivana De Carlo on the resurgence of extremist and terrorist groups during the pandemic. And as I mentioned, coming up soon, another paper by Yannicka on the Brexit extension question and this bigger publication before the summer on the future relationship. And I'll be back next Friday with Yanis and Fabian, not in our usual time. Uh, we're going to be moving to early afternoon, so two o'clock next Friday, where we will bring you all the latest uh, developments and discuss their implications. So thank you very much to all of you for joining us. I wish you a pleasant weekend in the sunshine. If the sun is shining wherever you are, it is here in Brussels. Stay safe and see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.